Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our weekly recap of our chronological reading through the Reese Chronological Bible. We finished up week number 29. We're at the 23rd of July in 2022. The period of time that we have read about this past week has been from around 622 BC to 599 to 600 BC. We're at that point in time where southern Judah has gone into captivity to Babylon. A little over 100 years prior to this, the northern kingdom of Israel went into captivity to the Assyrians. And as time progressed, the Babylonians grew in their power and they defeated the Assyrians. And we also have read this week that they defeated <clears throat> the Egyptians that were trying to make a comeback. And they uh, sieged uh, Jerusalem in southern Judah and began to take uh, captives and to deport them from the area of Judea over into Babylon. When we started this past week's reading, we were in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was referred to as that weeping prophet, and uh, he lived and ministered during the time just before and during the time of the Babylonian captivity. <clears throat> Other contemporary prophets with him would have been uh, Micah and uh, towards the tail end of Hosea and also Habakkuk, we will see in our reading that we went through this week. But when we started off this week, we were in the seventh chapter of the book of Jeremiah, and he was given instruction to stand in the gates of the city and proclaim uh, coming judgment if the, people's, the people didn't change their ways and repent. And God told Jeremiah to go to Shiloh to see the remains and the historical things there that were left after what happened to northern uh, kingdom of Israel when the people had been disobedient. <clears throat> Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle was first erected after the people uh, entered into the promised land after their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Shiloh is the place where Eli had been the prophet and the priest and he had a couple of sons that were no good. And it was during that time and in that place where Samuel was taken to uh, by Hannah, his mother, to be lent to the Lord as a fulfillment to the vow that she made that if she would have a male child, she would give him to the Lord all of his life. And so it was at Shiloh that Eli was uh, raising <clears throat> young Samuel in addition to his two older boys of his family. And uh, since then, the tabernacle was moved to Jerusalem after David became king. And then, of course, when Solomon became the king, the temple was built. And then years later, northern Israel went into captivity, and we're now approaching the time when southern Judah has gone into captivity. But the interesting thing that we see about what God told Jeremiah uh, is a little bit shocking. I'm going to read some verses from Jeremiah chapter 7 that we read at the beginning of this past week. Verse 16 to 20. Therefore do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead the dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? Therefore, as thus says the Lord, behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out in this place on man and on beast on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. 
So Jeremiah mourned for his people. And he said in chapter 8, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. In the next chapter, chapter 9, <clears throat> we were told of this coming day when God will judge all of the uncircumcised nations and the house of Israel who are uncircumcised in their heart, God said. And yet in all of that talk and prophecy about the oncoming judgment, God referred to Israel as the tribe of his inheritance, indicating that eventually, one day way out into the future, there would be a time of restoration. Then we read in the 11th chapter of Jeremiah that he wrote again about the broken covenant that Judah did not keep the Mosaic covenant uh, with the Lord. And again, that he was told not to pray for those people. And these kind of things make me concerned about our country because uh, the people in our country in our day have done just as many bad and probably worse things than those people in northern Israel and southern Judah did back in those days. And God brought judgment upon them. God told Jeremiah that the people would be against him but they would not kill him and he would watch out for him and he was to be a spokesman and he again spoke about a time way out into the future about restoration. We came across a subheading that Reese put in his chronological Bible that said Babylon is the world power and the dates that he gave for them being that world power were from 612 BC to 539 BC. They followed the uh, uh, Assyrians and Babylon represented that first great empire of the four empires that would rule the world that were Gentile empires that we'll see about here in a little bit from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And Babylon was that head of gold. They will be followed up by the Medes and the Persians. So we read about this young king who wasn't so young by this time, Josiah, who was a good king, and he died in battle against the Egyptians. And we were reading in 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings about that. And then his son Jehoahaz became the king, and he was described as being a bad king, and he only reigned for three months. And then Pharaoh Necho uh, from Egypt took him captive and placed a brother of his, Eliakim, uh, who was also, of course, his brother and a son of Josiah, which would be king in, instead of him. And he changed his name from Eliakim to Jehoiakim. And he reigned for 11 years. And he also was referred to as a bad king. And at the beginning of his reign, God instructed Jeremiah to make yokes and bonds to use as an object lesson to the people about the upcoming judgment. And then they proclaimed that Jeremiah was a traitor and God had to protect him to being uh, not put to death at that time. The next day we came to this little three chapter book of Habakkuk. Some people uh, pronounce it Habakkuk and I pronounce it Habakkuk. So I'm not sure exactly what is supposed to be the correct pronunciation, but uh, we came to this little book, a minor prophet book of Habakkuk. It's got three chapters. And he was living during the time when he saw all of this unrighteousness and injustice going on in southern Judah. And <clears throat> he prayed and asked God, basically, why in the world aren't you doing something about this? Uh, all of this unrighteousness. And God basically told him, I am going to do something about it. You just watch and see. Uh, even if I told you, it'd be hard for you to imagine. <clears throat> he said that he was going to bring the Chaldeans in to uh, defeat southern Judah and take them hostage. And then all of a sudden Habakkuk said, wait, wait. How is it that you can use a people that are more unrighteous than we are to bring judgment upon us? And God tried to assure him that when it was all said and done, they also would receive judgment. And from that, uh, 
communication back and forth between God and Habakkuk came the most famous verse that we find in the little book of Habakkuk in chapter 2 and verse 4 when Habakkuk finally understood what God was telling him and he wrote, the just shall live by faith. When we get over into the New Testament, we will find a trilogy of quotes from that verse. We'll find it mentioned in the book of Romans and in the book of Galatians and in the book of Hebrews. And it's first given to us in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. The just shall live by faith. <clears throat> and then Habakkuk understood that after God used the Babylonians to bring judgment upon the unrighteous and disobedient Jews of southern Judah, then he also would bring judgment on the Babylonians. We came to the time of 606 BC when Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon first put a siege around Jerusalem and in Judah and began to carry off captives. And uh, we found out from reading in the 25th chapter of Jeremiah that that captivity would last for 70 years. And it, we will find out later that the reason that it is to be 70 years is because that's the number of years that the children of Israel were disobedient and did not let the land lay idle every seventh year. Every seventh year was considered a sabbatical year. It was a Shemitah cycle. And then they were to leave the land lay idle in year number seven. And God would provide for them if they were obedient an abundance of a harvest in the sixth year that would tide them over <clears throat> until they planted in the eighth year and then harvested the next year. But all during that period of time, they did not do that for a 490 year period of time. And we'll find that 490 year period of time is a significant number of years, especially when we get over into the book of Daniel in the next week or two at chapter number nine. But <clears throat> for 70 years that they were to have let the land lay idle, they didn't do that. And so God's going to have them in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. And during that time, the land will enjoy her Sabbath years laying idle. So then we came to this little bit of history that was put in there about this battle of Carchemish, where the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians. And we probably have read about that in secular history when we were in school. <clears throat> then we came to uh, chapter one of Daniel. And we read about Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, all being deported to Babylon. And they all had their names changed. That was part of the plan that they had to take them away from their home and their surroundings, familiar surroundings, even to change their names and to make them learn a foreign language, the language of the Babylonians. And only the choicest ones were taken. And it was a fulfillment of a prophecy that Isaiah had told Hezekiah. Remember when he was given those 15 extra years to live and when it was time for him to prepare to leave and Isaiah scolded him basically for showing the entourage that came to visit him and put on a show like they were uh, coming in uh, a good visit, a kind visit and he showed them everything that was in his kingdom, all of his treasures and so forth. And Isaiah kind of scolded him and told him that one of these days, the country where they came from, Babylon, which at that particular time was not a world power, but they are in the time in which we're reading. And Isaiah told him that one of these days, Babylon will come and will take some of your descendants and make them eunuchs in the land of Babylon. And Isaiah I told that to Hezekiah, and Hezekiah had that unfortunate answer that he said, well, at least there will be peace during my lifetime. So we've passed his lifetime. We've now come to the fulfillment of that. And we see that Dan Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are all taken captive. And they're put under the authority of the prince of the eunuchs. We never ever 
read of any of those guys having wives or families or children. And that leads me to believe that they were made to be eunuchs in the land of Babylon. But they were of the king's lineage and were uh, sharp young men. And they were ones that were chosen to put in this three-year training program. And we know the story about the diet that uh, they were supposed to be eating that came from the king's table and how that they did not want to defile themselves. We deduce from later reading in other chapters in the book of Daniel that it wasn't because necessarily they were against drinking wine or against eating that particular kind of food, but they probably had learned that it had been offered to idols and they didn't want to take part in that. And so then we read the story how that they were allowed to be tested for 10 days and ate nothing but vegetables or pulse or uh, we might think beans and cornbread, whatever it was, it, it was not the fancy meal that came from the king's table and God blessed them and they were allowed to uh, remain on that diet for their training program. And at the end of that training program, we read that they were 10 times better, smarter than all the uh, magicians and astrologists and the soothsayers and all of the people in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. And so they were put in places of prominence in the, uh, in the kingdom. Then we came to chapter two of Daniel and we learned about this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And he didn't tell the dream to the magicians and the astrologers and soothsayers. He told them he wanted them to tell them what the dream was. Then he would believe the interpretation of it that they gave him. And of course they couldn't do that. And we read how that Daniel uh, made an appeal for a period of time and that he would then give the king the answer to his question. And he and his three friends had their uh, prayer time, no doubt fasting and praying, and God gave them the answer to their prayer and gave Daniel the dream and its interpretation. And that was the dream that had the future of the world empires, the Gentile empires that would rule the world until the Messiah comes to set up his kingdom. And we're still in the midst of that in the day in which you and I live. We're still living in that age of the Gentiles, so to speak. But from all appearances, it's soon going to come to an end because 73 years ago uh, or 74 years ago, the nation of Israel once again became an independent autonomous nation in 1948. But we don't want to get on too many rabbit trails, so we'll stick to what we're looking at here. So... <clears throat> God used Jeremiah, when we went back to his book to begin reading, as an object lesson uh, to the people about the coming judgment that was going to take place. And uh, the judgment, uh, we learned, became, or came as a consequence to the evil that the evil king Manasseh had done. Now Manasseh was the son of Hezekiah, and he reigned for 55 years, and he was a bad and evil king. At one time when he was taken captive, we read that he humbled himself before God and God had mercy on him and allowed him to go back home. And it appeared as though he tried to make reforms, but he couldn't undo all of the evil that he had done in the previous years and the people wouldn't pay attention. And he died and his son Ammon uh, became the king and he was just as bad or worse and he only reigned a short period of time. And then... Uh, Josiah became the king. Well, the judgment's going to come about, we read, because of the consequences of Manasseh's evilness that he did. And God then said that there would be a remnant of the people that would survive. We find that all the way through scripture. Whenever God is dealing with people and there's going to be judgment take place, there always will be a remnant of people that will be true believers that will follow after him and seek his righteousness. And that was the case that he said here, that there would be a remnant that would survive. Jeremiah was told that he was not to marry. We've already talked about that he was recognized as the weeping prophet because he cried for his people. He even cried for his own condition. And uh, <clears throat> we're told that God would not allow him to be married Things were going to be so bad during those times. 
that he didn't want Jeremiah uh, responsible for trying to bring up a family during those terrible times. <clears throat> we read in Jeremiah chapter 17 some verses, a couple of them, <clears throat> that were very similar to what we read in Psalm number 1. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf shall be green and it will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding its fruit. And uh, we're kind of going through a hot drought spell uh, right now in the time in which we are here in the middle of Oklahoma. And we can a little bit identify with that type of thinking and how everything is all of a sudden the last two or three weeks started turning brown. And God's trying to say in this passage and also in Psalm 1 that the people who put their, play, or their faith and trust in the Lord will be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water and will always flourish and bring forth its fruit in its season. Well, right after that came a famous passage in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 that will no doubt be familiar. The verse reads, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We ended up this week's reading to, with today's reading, Jeremiah standing in the gate of the city and warning the king and all the people that come through to not abuse the Sabbath day, but to hallow the Sabbath day. They were carrying on like it was just another regular day, doing commerce and going in and out and not observing the Mosaic law in their observance of the Sabbath day. And Jeremiah was told to go stand there and warn the people that they needed to observe the Sabbath day. And Jeremiah was given another object lesson. God told him to go down to the potter's house and to see what he saw. And when he went down there, he saw that the vessel that the potter was making became marred and so the potter made it into another vessel, uh, the, something that seemed good to him from the marred vessel that he had. And that was to be an object lesson, how that God as the potter and Israel and southern Judah as the clay, that God will mold and make them into something. And they, because of their disobedience, were marred and not made into the original image or purpose that God had for them that we might recall reading from way back in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5, where God told Moses that if the people would obey him, he would make them a peculiar people above all the other kingdoms of the earth, and they would be his kingdom of, or kingdom of priests and kings, and they would be like his witness to the rest of the world. And they failed in doing that. So God's going to remold them and make them like that potter, remolded that marred piece of clay and make it into something that is pleasing to him. One of the interesting things, speaking about remnants, is that knowing prophetical passages that are ahead of us in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, there's coming a day and time beyond the day in which you and I live when the church is removed from the world and God will deal again with the nation of Israel in that last of the 70 weeks of years that we'll read about in chapter 9 of Daniel, that at that time, he will seal 144,000 Jewish preacher boys that will finally fulfill God's plan and purpose for the nation of Israel to become evangelists to people all over the globe. But that's way down the line in our reading from here. So we ended up the week with Jeremiah experiencing signs of depression because of the persecution of his adversaries. And next week, at the beginning of our week's reading tomorrow, we'll get further into these deportations of various peoples that go into uh, Babylon. We'll get to the book of Ezekiel and see how Ezekiel is uh, taken captive and deported. And we'll eventually then get into some of his ministry and the things that he wrote and uh, they're quite amazing. So we'll see what next week's recap has to, to give us a week from now. Father, thank you for our time that we've had reading and studying your word this week. Help us that we might be faithful in doing that. 
Thank you for those who join us online and for those who are going along in the reading of the Chronological Bible with us this year. We pray that you would bless them, help all of us that we might see many applications of spiritual uh, principles that we read about in the Old Testament that we can and should apply to our lives today. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Well, I hope you have a great rest of the weekend. Enjoy tomorrow, uh, fellowship with other believers on the Lord's Day, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, Lord bless you.